Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We, today, we're going to talk with Veronica Buckelman. Uh, and we are getting fewer and fewer in the audience. And I, th I heard that there is starting to be an epidemic of, um, of, of listeners, maybe. But also, uh, very many has uh, sore throat, streptococcus, I think, many of them, as me. Uh, so maybe it's um, I'm the source, I don't know. Um, but uh, try to take care of yourself. Uh, drink Ingver tea, which is the only thing that functions, I believe. Uh, and be careful. Uh, the Norwegian summers are, uh, all, are always a bit tricky to, to, to pass. Um, today we're going to talk uh, with Veronica, and she's a German artist. Um, that uh, have different studies behind herself, like psychology, acting, and performance studies. Um, she has made documentary theater and lecture performances uh, several places in the world, like Norway, Argentina, and Germany. So, uh, some of the topics we're going to talk about here is documentary theater, lecture performance, site-specific theater, and the audience connected to all these topics. Um, it's hard to describe uh, Veronica's performances in a sentence or two, uh, mainly because they seem to be less conceptual than sensual, I would say. Um, in, the, in, the, in the meaning that um, they talk to the senses uh, or try to trigger the senses of the spectator. So it's not like one headline describes the performance like we could do yesterday with Fix and Foxy. Uh, it's another entrance to performance art, I would say. Uh, so one example would be for uh, would be uh, the performance Tiskertus, uh, which could be trans. Tiskajente was the title. Ah, it was sorry. about yeah yeah no problem. Tis Tiskajente, yeah. <laughs> uh, which could be translated to German girl. Um, Tiskertus is the uh, Norwegian uh, how to call it uh, mobbed. Yeah. yeah, it's a negative term. It's about uh, um, it's about uh, women that e during the war had a um, relationship to German um, soldiers, Norwegian women having relationship to German soldiers, because after the war ended, um, these uh, women uh, were uh, in, uh, were uh, put into internment camps. Um, because of observation, they were either considered as, I think, dangerous or stupid or mad or whatever. Uh, so, so they went through an internment period. Um, and uh, in Oslo, this internment camp was uh, placed in Huvudöja, which is an um, island in the middle of Oslofjord, not far from here. So this performance was uh, on Huvudöja in 2008. Um, and uh, it was taking place in the main house in Hovedøya, where the audience was invited one, to, one by one to walk into this space. And then there would be different installation elements in the rooms. Like, for instance, there was a f uh, archive boxes uh, where, where, where there were placed performers uh, exposing uh, p uh, naked parts of their body where they, when, while they talked, uh, recited the text of the documents, for instance. Um, another example would be uh, Present Past, also from Oslo. This is a performance about the, the, the Jewish communities in this neighborhood uh, that existed here before 1942 and the big deportation of Jews um, in Oslo. In 42. Uh, this is a kind of guided tour which uses um, iPads. So you, uh, if I should try to explain it, it's like you, you hold up an iPad in front of the place an iPod, where you it's are. It's smaller, but yeah. Ah, it was an iPod. I'm <laughs> sorry. So you hold up an iPod uh, in front of you, uh, so you see the um, same background that is actually here, uh, but in another time though. Uh, and then you are told to walk uh, the same path as what you can see in front of the screen. So you see another time on the screen than in the reality behind you. And then you are told the story of the Jewish community in the place. So it's kind of mixes of your perception of time and space somehow and makes you have a weird, for me at least, feeling of where you are in time and space. Um, it's also kind of, I would say, 
talking to your senses in a way that makes you aware of gaps of time, for instance, and what has happened in another concretely physical, uh, sensual way. So as you can see, um, both of these performances and, uh, is happening outside a normal theater space. And uh, they try to use uh, the location in a very specific way. So, uh, so something we found interesting about this uh, is um, uh, both uh, documentary theater, lecture performances, and Veronica's work uh, is that the audience somehow is challenged in their perception all the time, I would say, somehow. So first of all, um, there seem to exist a lot of different definition or perspective of what documentary theater is, or the term documentary theater. It can sometimes seem to mean uh, that you put actual text that you have found somewhere, uh, uh, which is not a dramatic text, in, in, um, and which is non-fictional in a theater performance. Sometimes you can hear it referred to as that. Sometimes it's used to describe a specific process of research, and I even seen it used in a certain about certain aesthetics, like uh, I mean, it's even clear in film where you have this genre called mockumentary, which is a fiction film, but it uses kind of the aesthetics of a documentary. So my question is just uh, how 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 should we use the term in this conversation, or how do you use it if you use <coughs> it? Well, for me, I really don't want to define the term here, but f for me, many of my projects take as a starting point something that has happened in reality, or so it definitely, um, yeah, is based on extensive research, and this research will brought, I do think that we develop concepts, but really with an extensive research behind. And it can have many forms. I would not use it in a sense of a specific aesthetic. For instance, Therese Bjornebu wrote over about um, Tiska Yente that the piece challenges the aesthetic um, conventions that have perhaps started to be established about documentary theater, which is a lot having an amateur on stage, like a daily life expert. And I think there is many, many ways of putting elements of reality on stage. Um, and I think that each of those topics that one approaches also demands a different form, in a way. Yeah, because also the use of non-actors on stage is also something that we can very often see in documentary theatre, right? Yeah, definitely. And um, I'm sure many interesting works can done with it, but for me, um, I feel that it has also its limits. For instance, um, when we developed this performance about the war brides, um, the lovers of German soldiers, um, we also did interviews with some of the women, the only women though who wanted to talk about it really because there has been a huge silence about the topic where women who lived in Germany who had actually married their German soldiers and it had turned out into a Romeo and Juliet story. And of course, uh, we. For a moment we were thinking, could it be interesting to invite some of those women there and it could very easily be a hip and trendy ironic piece where it is about the trauma of the past but now it's like nice happy women sitting there and knitting and drinking tea with you. But uh, for us, um, what I was really intrigued by was what we also found in the archive which was really a huge violence um, that I think has not been talked about. And I did not want to put women who had perhaps not talked about it for 50 years in the position to even talk about their trauma in front of an audience. I wasn't interested in that either. So for me it was much more the question, how can I find a situation where those archive texts that we find can work on the audience or can step in relation to the audience so that the audience can perhaps re-experience these strong violence that I in the archive experienced by finding those texts. Like for instance, um, it was questions about the women um, that were estimating if they should get sterilized or not, like questions, is she rebellious or 
do you think that she could transmit severe psychological disorders to her kids? So we were more looking yeah, for physical situations where the audience could experience also this dehumanization. And I think when you described the piece, it sounded a little bit strange. I don't know how, <laughs> like it was not just s some women with naked body parts. I think it was for us a bit more, um, but it is also difficult to describe them because it is really a sensual experience. But um, for instance, um, the women were put into these camps um, on suspicion of venereal diseases because there was no law, of course, to put them there because they made love with someone. So it was kind of this provisory law. So they were also, first of all, forced to get a gynecological in investigation. And so for us, it was also looking for a physical situation that also perhaps embodies this metaphor that they experience, like really violently revealing their intimate zone. And so we put them in those archive boxes, and yes, they did reveal parts of their body, but it was, it was sometimes also very subtle. It was perhaps in one box just a breathing belly that you could watch for 10 minutes, and then you also see how this belly breathes, how perhaps the heart jumps, and she was working with an archive text within this box. So it was very much a one-to-one -one contact between performer's body and, and the audience. And for instance, at one point, one of the audience members really jumped up and screamed because she first thought that it is puppets sitting in those boxes. Um, but, and then she screamed, oh, they are human. So for us, it was also a really physical metaphor of yeah, experiencing this dehumanization that happened. When you create uh, performances like this, do you um, do you start from the material and the question about how, how do I work with this material in a theatrical context? How do I transport it and, 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 and show it somehow? What is the process here? Um, yeah, but I guess I understand theater and that has perhaps also to do with my um, experience of being partly trained in Frederick's that not necessarily as starting from a traumatic text, but um, very much also um, based in time and space and in relation of me, of the audience, with time, space, other bodies. Um, and so, yes, I'm looking for a situation that combines this, definitely. Mm. Uh, but could you say also be more concrete of how, how you actually work? Do you, do you have like, okay, I'm going to make a performance about, the, um, for instance, uh, Tyskeriente. Mm -hmm. uh, do you start with, okay, I want to make a performance about this topic? Yeah. And I want to make it there. Do you, do you have the uh, location right away? Or do yeah, you think like, what is the best location? With to Tuska this? Yente, it was really starting from the location and from the topic. Like, because I got very much intrigued when I heard about this island where the internment camp was based. Um, and nobody knew about it really. Like everybody goes there to swim. So for me, it was this contrast that inspired me. But this process was also special because it was our first big project after graduation. So there we researched for one year and we were in 10 different archives in Germany and in Norway. And it took us eight months to develop the concept. And that's, I guess, today, I, I'm sometimes also, f f um, I can also start the other way around. For instance, with present past, we started from the form more. Like we knew that we want to guide the audience members around and then we started to do the in the extensive archive research. So it can be both ways, I think. Mm. Uh, s uh, interesting part of this is, uh, of course, this, the location, the site. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what happens when you bring an th uh, audience in uh, of a theater performance in another place? What does, that, what, do, what does that do with the perception of the audience, you think? Um, I think they are, partly more opened, like to also accept things that rupture the, the theater conventions. I mean, for instance, with the travel to the island, you anyway, it becomes much broader. Like first you take the boat out there, so you're getting prepared a bit. But then also um, many things that in theater already have a meaning. Like for instance, when the audience was waiting until they were let into the house, 
they were eating soup out there. And if I serve soup in theater, we talked about it yesterday, it already, uh, oh, they serve soup, they want to interact. But, uh, but if you do it site specific, it is what it is more, which I find interesting. Like you can create a very direct and very honest contact with the audience members that perhaps in theater you don't have. So I think it was also very different, for instance, to have those alienated physical situations with the performers in a space like this than in theater. I think in theater it would be much more strange or just strange if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. Mm. So I feel they are really more open to many different perceptual experiences that challenge what theater can be. So your, 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 your senses is somehow, um, you have to deal with senses in another way. Let's mm -hmm. say in in each location somehow. Um, uh, I, I just wonder about one thing. It would, would be nice to clarify since we called your perf uh, workshop for a lecture performance. Yeah, you asked me to give a workshop on lecture performance. Yeah, uh, so maybe you should, should also uh, clarify that term or how you use it in that context. I guess uh, is it a subcategory of uh, documentary theater somehow? I feel for me, a lecture performance can very often be the, the base of a documentary theater performance because for me it is a way of having a, a quite a straightforward contact to the audience where I can speak as the researcher of the project. Like, for instance, we did another bigger theater performance um, about the, the, the economic crash in Argentina and when we presented it in Berlin, we also worked with some Argentinian performers, but I think what made it more partly a lecture performance that me and my film crew were also on stage as the researchers. So I feel I embody in a certain way already the subjectivity behind it or the, the, the making gaze or so. Yeah, I think for me, it, it is really this contact that defines a lecture performance. To talk as a researcher. To, to be able to talk as a, yeah, as a researcher or as a developer or, but, but also to share something, uh, whether it is knowledge or an experience or. So where is the thea theatrical or performative um, aesthetical elements coming that, in? That you group? don't say something just with words, but that you also create an experience, like you do something to evoke an experience, like that it's not just knowledge passed on, but yeah. Um, but also an experience in a certain way, I would say. Mm. But of course, there is many hybrid forms of lecture performance. I mean, it also really depends who does it. There is lecture performers who could combine it with dance, or I could jump up and run around. But, but apart from that, I think what makes a lecture performance what distinguishes it from lecture is also, yeah, that it's not just coherent knowledge transmitted, but that it can, for instance, if it's a lecture performance about something historical, that it can also confront much more with the incoherencies of history or, yeah. Paradoxes. Paradoxes. Um, you also tend to use um, new technology quite often in your performances, I would say. Um, well. Uh, yeah, I guess that has to do with um, part of my studies that you forgot to mention <laughs> in my career um, was media art and media philosophy at the University for Arts in Berlin. So I worked a lot with also video installations, but also there I'm very interested in um, integrating the physical experience of the audience. Like I worked a lot before I worked with theater with for instance, reprojections on objects on tables that also challenged in certain way the, yeah, the, the, the spatial perception of the audience. But also here, I think I'm often very interested in asking what does um, a certain use of media do to me? Like, for instance, if I'm on Skype or something, what does it really do with the, with the way of communication? What kind of desire or longing does that produce in me? And how can I restage that? perhaps, or, but also I see media as a way of creating intimacy that perhaps we cannot always create so easily in a traditional theater context. Um, like for instance, 
I just developed a small installation in New York where we could perhaps have you as an example to show something in terms of how I mean that. Because I think I can use media also <laughs> with the theater e education, um, again, to talk to an audience in a very intimate way. Like, I made an installation where the audience member has an iPod where a small film is running and he holds it in front of the own mouth and looks in a mirror and I speak to him over this medium. Okay. And I would like always to demonstrate it, but usually you would be alone with this or okay. perhaps somebody would... I, would I play that I'm alone in front of a mirror. Yeah, so you are always dance mirror. Yeah. Like this? You don't need the microphone. Okay. I think it should work. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. Okay. As you like, I mean, <laughs> I can also tell you more about it. Oh, you want to show uh, the whole thing? It's five minutes, <laughs> yeah? Okay, if you're up for I it. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has Nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. <laughs> I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you. nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you. That has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot 
get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I have to clarify that I cannot get involved with you, and that has nothing to do with identity politics. I cannot talk about identity politics. To travel, I get involved with you, and that <coughs> has nothing to do with identity politics. interesting emotional journey to be in. Also, when you don't see yourself? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's very strange. Because, yeah, with the mirror, you also see more details, because at one point, it's really tears running down through at the corners of the screen. And it's in two parts. Like, one part is actually a bit more a monologue, almost, I would say, but where I also really directly talk to the audience member, where I really speak, how does it feel to have my lips? I want to tell you something, and then I actually talk about an, an encounter that I, I had with an Orthodox Jew, uh, who tried, a very old man who wanted to hit on me on a park bench. But, but this meeting here is based, or this simple line was based on email from an ex-lover, where it was really identity issues involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not sure if I want to hear, hear the whole story. <laughs> yeah, that you won't get a, a whole story. <laughs> but you see, for me, I mean, my, I guess sometimes my work is perhaps also not so easy to categorize because I don't like, I, I don't think I have to, or any one of us has to just work in one strict category. So is this theater or, in, or an installation or a performance? I, it's not so important, I think but I'm interested in the relation to the audience in one way or the other. And also as an actress, of course, I have certain skills that I can use when I design something like this, I think. I think you, you already said something about it, but could you reflect a little bit more about like n using new technology in, in theater spaces or theater performances? Because I think it's sometimes we have this tendency to make it kind of a cool installation element or some, some okay, we need some projector here. Well, very often to, it's mainly it that, like to have a projection in the backdrop. Yeah, I guess. So how to, how to how to think about this technology in a way that makes it an uh, 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 element of a performance, a stage element or theater element? Well, for me, I guess it has a lot to do again with creating a physical sensation. Like, for instance, um, in the Argentina piece um, when we showed it in Buenos Aires, really we recreated a spatial situation that we had observed, but with video. Like there, it was a lot that, um, after the economic crash, for instance, it was a huge rise of iron protection elements in front of windows and everything. So there, we recreated a spatial situation, but it was str partly alienated. Like the audience were sitting in between four screens where we had filmed close up of hands interacting through these bars or of people communicating through these bars. So you, you were surrounded by the screens, but again, it created really a situation and it was not just a visual backdrop. So I think to think about if you want to use video or something to think about it more in a spatial way, it already makes much more sense as just in a visual way because we, yeah, we are in a sensual space, I think. But in general, what, I, what for me I think is more important, again, is what I, I think I earlier started to mention, is the intimacy that you actually can create with the medium, which I find quite interesting often. Hmm. So, which then really challenges the theater frame, I think, if hmm. you are with a mirror and this. Like, yeah. hmm. Another topic I would also like to um, bring up is, is the question about <coughs> um, when you use uh, documentary material or research in a performance and the ethical questions connected to it. I know we have had some kind of ethical talks before. I just want, first of all, I just want to say that 
for me, uh, I don't think it's an important issue whether you, we do right or wrong. It we turn kind of start to go there very fast. Is it right or wrong what you do? I'm not sure if that's the most interesting path when mm -hmm. we're going to discuss ethics. It's it's whether what are the consequences and how should we think about it. I think if we if we make something that we put something at risk, I think we are always in danger of doing wrong. And we should accept that, and we should accept that we probably do wrong. I just wanted to call that speech before you, we get into that. But uh, what do you think about the ethical problems of, of, of using documentary materials in, in performances? Is there, or do you often have ethical uh, problems around Oh, that? of course, with every performance, I think every artist has ethical problems. Um, before I answer to your question specifically, I think we already have an ethical problem just if we make classical theatre. We also have to ask ourselves what kind of um, aesthetics or what kind of social order do we reinstill on the audience. So I think we always have an ethical question for us to answer. But of course with documentary issues, many other very specific and concrete questions come in. And, and I think that is for every performance very different. But um, of course, when you work documentary, you're also confronted with many issues that documentary filmmakers are also confronted. Like, uh, for instance, how do you use the material of a person? How do you edit it? How do you represent it? Uh, yeah. Or let me think of a really difficult dilemma. Well, or, or for me, for instance, just traveling to Argentina with 100,000 euro or something and, and spending time with people who had lost their houses in the economic crisis, of course, that, that I mean, there's so many ethical issues. I, I don't know, like... Already when we start to make a performance about someone that has been kind of a um, victim for something, already there it starts maybe uh, uh, to victimize someone or to put them in a position of someone is suffering. How do we talk about suffering? Who, who, who am I to point out someone is suffering and what is a victim? I, I already yeah. there it's maybe a, some dilemmas to, to deal with. Definitely, but I can also ask a person really about his or her experience without presenting him as a victim. Mm. If I try to rather share mm. his or her experience further. So uh, how to do that, for instance? How to approach uh, the object of research in a way that... I don't think I have an answer that I can give and say, do it like this and you will not have ethical dilemmas. This for, for sure not. Um, I guess for me, one answer in Argentina was to spend extremely a lot of time with the people I interviewed, like sitting for several days with the homeless people on the mattresses, but also being for some days in the gated communities, like really also, yeah, I don't know, establishing a lot of contact, uh, trying at least in some glimpses to phenomenologically experience uh, how, what their daily life situation is. But I don't know if that makes it better ethically. I mean, this is oh. just, yeah. Or, or also to try as, yeah, to give something back to the people who you work with. Like, for instance, at the end we made we first thought we'd make a work in progress showing there, but then we had the feeling that it was much more right to invite everybody to a dinner from all the different backgrounds, uh, which in Argentina is already a big thing because the social segregation is so huge that it was very interesting to have everybody sitting at one table, sorry, in the end, but yeah. Hmm. So for you to create a dialogue yeah. it seems very important. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we should uh, move forward to the question part of the interview. So I invite you, the audience, to ask questions and we already have a couple. Hello, um, I had the pleasure of working with um, uh, Veronica and um, uh, um, so I wanted to follow up some uh, one of the last things that was said with a question and um, regarding the victims or the ones suffering and it seems perhaps you're more interested in the system that oppresses mm -hmm. rather than the oppressed 
Uh, so correct, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. And but if you're interested in a system, often it can be very, very, a very um, um, boring to listen to a system or statistics or, or archive material. So how do you, uh, uh, when you talk about an oppressing system, how do you make this physical? How do you make this alive? And you want the audience to experience that oppression or not? I'm not sure if I'm thinking about oppression necessarily as a term, but um, I mean, I tried to describe it earlier, for instance, with the Tuska Yente, with the performance about the warbirds, where we worked, had the pleasure also to work together. Um, that you talked about the statistics. Um, for instance, there, as, as we said before, the, the women were put into the camp um, because of um, venereal diseases, officially, or suspicion. But if you look at the statistics, you see that it is actually only like one woman who had gonorrhea, or like it was really, really few. And so we used the text, the original text material, really. Like we only worked in the performance with, with the source material in a physical situation. like. That there, for instance, it was um, the breast looking out of the box, and you heard the statistics to it. So it was a very simple thing, I, I think. But of course, on stage, um, again, it is you have to use different ways of creating a situation where original text material can work. I think, but. I'm not sure if that was a good answer to, <laughs> but I, I think in, in, in the performance about the warbirds, we definitely rather try to stage the gaze on the women than letting them speak as victimized from, from that position. I, yeah, I don't know. I think um, when I heard you, it, it sounded kind of interesting, this um, relationship between document and uh, fiction or construction. And I wonder, um, I wonder if the, uh, if the, because you mentioned it several times, you mentioned for, for instance that uh, in a lecture performance, what is interesting is that you actually have maybe done this, so your body and your um, your person as a whole um, is kind of a document of that re research. And um, or at Hovid Oya, you, you had this real uh, building. So uh, it seems as if this um, realness has a, has a form of aura, mm -hmm. you could maybe even say, that, that actually took place there, or you actually did this, somehow commun com is communicated when you then um, stage it. And um, I wonder, when does this documentary aura not exist any longer? And, and when do you then choose to rather um, construct it? Well, I can give one very, very concrete example that we also work, for instance, as, as specifically in lecture performances with or with documents, really. Like, um, and I must say, in the archive research, it is very often really strong experience to be in the archive and to discover and document yourself. And then sometimes you even feel with your fingers the print of the typewriter who was writing these really violent words. But then if you just show this document, and specifically as a copy, it totally loses its aura. <laughs> so, in one lecture performance, for instance, so we had a copy of a document, but we decided to fake it to look old again. Like, we would use it as an object in the performance, but so we put it into coffee and tea to make it look old. And of course, if, I'm, if I get asked in the, 
um, after talk, is this the original document? I say it's a copy made old. I don't have a problem with that. But just the effective moment of, to, of presenting it to the audience, there we used a camera so that they can see single words, for instance. For me, it is worth um, using some elements of fiction, but I do so in order to recreate an effective response, I think. So you decided from case to case, in a way, in the very concrete situation, what, what is what should uh, be kept uh, real and what what should be constructed. Yeah, but for the most part, my method, I think, is to to first try to let the real material speak. Like, how can we make uh, what situ How ca how can I perhaps talk or read out this archive material? Can can I whisper it or whatever? in order to yeah, let it resonate with you. But, but first I would really start from the material and, or from the bodies. Or, yeah. And when I hear the word lecture mm -hmm. and lecture performance, I sort of get um, uh, maybe a wrong first impression, but I, I think of uh, the point being to teach me facts or history or... Um, but now when you talk about it, it seems more that you're interested in the uh, human um, connection and to uh, give um, um, experience and to work with feelings and instead. So I'm not sure if I understand what the lecture is, is the point to um, teach the public, uh, the audience facts also? I guess it is a mixture. Um, but I think a good example may be, for instance, we made a lecture performance which was um, partly based on interviews that we made with a German soldier who, who was now 90 years old but who used to be in Norway. And he, of course, had a very specific view on Norway. Um, like, per, he, for instance, experienced Norway as a really peaceful country, and that uh, the Norwegians loved him. And he uh, he had tears in his eyes when he was singing the national anthem. And uh, it's not so much the truth value of his perception. Like, I, if I recount his experience, it is not necessarily that I say, look, this is how the occupation time was, but it is about show showing one subjective perspective and then opposing it with different perspectives and showing also what perhaps his view, which where he, he was not alone, by, by the way, in, in this perception, what perhaps also has this produced, like, um, which I think for Norwegians must have been quite humiliating to be perceived as, oh, we are one race, we, yeah. So I think it is partly about knowledge. Uh, th there can be facts, but it is also about more than that. I, I just also want to add that uh, for me, my personal experience of, of also academic lectures, if they function, if I'm concentrated, there is something more there in than called facts. There oh. is a certain... Oh, definitely. And then there is also now the academic genre, which I would not call lecture performance, but perhaps performance lecture, um, where academics choose consciously to perform knowledge. Like, for instance, there is one lecture of dance scholar Susan Lee Foster, where she... Um, I mean, she's reading out and she's experimenting this in many ways, but for instance, at one point she asks some audience member to come on stage and to always follow her movements, like to mirror her. And at the same time, she talks about certain dance forms and that's not in all dance forms important to be totally precise in, in recreating the movement, so, which of course you actually see performed at the same time. So it's very much about creating the experience um, yeah or, yeah, or performing knowledge, but that you perceive it with your body as well. So I think there's also this huge academic trend to, to do that in many ways. Thank you. Okay, I think we should, uh, we are over the time, uh, so we should take a break. And after the break, uh, we're gonna meet in the auditorium, 
where Mike is going to show us some videos and talk about the Yes Men's uh, work. Uh, we're going to have the interview with Mike tomorrow. So it's going to be like this. We just wanted, since he's here, and, see, and we wanted to have the possibility to show some of the work so everyone knows it before we have the interview. So if we uh, take a 10 minutes break and then we'll be in the auditorium, and for the ones that don't know where it is, come to the reception. Thank you very much, Veronica. Thank you.